So we're going to slowly trickle in, which is probably fine because no one really came here to hear me talk. But my name is Jeff Paul, and I'm the editor in chief of the Virginia Policy Review, which is Batten's student run policy journal. Um, and I'd like to start off today by thanking, first of all, all the attendees so much for joining us. I think we have a great um, selection of panels for you all. Um, and I also do uh, need to take a few moments to thank Sean Belowski, Ali Straley, and Megan Rivera, um, who are all members of VPR. Um, for organizing, promoting what's gonna be a great event. Um, <clears throat> also specifically, Millie Melton Hicks, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support uh, with all the event planning minutia. Um, it definitely wouldn't have happened without you. And thanks Diane and Ben for being awesome and on call for IT support throughout the afternoon. Hopefully we won't need you, but thanks anyways. Um, so when the group of us four came together last October to frame today's panels, we were um, confronted with a multitude of what foreign policy experts might call known unknowns. Um, we knew we couldn't predict what would happen as our election cycle drew to a close, um, certainly not how long it would be, take to be resolved. We knew we wouldn't know if groups would be allowed to um, gather in person in a meaningful way in late March, and we knew that predicting the news cycle's topic du jour would definitely be a quixotic uh, task at best. So one bet we did make, however, was that as a policy community and as Americans more broadly, we would still be discussing the functions of democracy by the time spring came around. Um, not exactly a bold prediction. I think Americans love discussing democracy about as much as any other topic. Um, but I'm really thankful Sean, Ali, and Megan pushed us in that direction. So for today, um, our eighth annual National Journal Conference will host experts from a variety of fields that um, sort of underpin our system of representative democracy. We'll hear from two experts in just a few minutes um, on how a party may best craft its platform to inspire support from its constituents. Um, following that, we'll hear from some media professionals who engage in real journalism, actively holding uh, public figures accountable and striving to build trust among members of our society. And finally, we'll hear from two panels on how education and specifically equitable access to education is vital in nourishing a democracy that serves this ever more perfect union. Um, one last note before I begin introductions on logistics. Each panel will run for about 55 minutes. The first 30 minutes or so will consist of discussion inclusive to the panel and a question and answer section will follow that. Now, just note, we have a student facilitator monitoring the Q&A throughout the entire panel. So please feel free to post questions at any time and we'll get to them towards the end of the hour. And then in between each panel, we'll have a brief five minute break while we do some um, Zoom musical chairs, if you will, um, and switch everyone out. So with that, I'd like to introduce a really dear friend of mine, Julia Stamper, who will introduce our panel on building a 2021 Republican Party platform. And she's also gonna facilitate the Q&A portion. Um, Julia is a dual degree student with Batten's Public Policy School and the University of Virginia School of Law. She holds a BA in political science from East Carolina University, not Eastern Carolina, Julia, don't worry, East Carolina. Um, her research interests center around the growing political polarization of the American public and ways to mitigate that polarization. I imagine that will come up today at some point. Um, this summer, Julia is interning for Judge Timothy Kelly of the United States District Court for District of Columbia, and she hopes to use her MPP and JD concurrently to both help policymakers design policies that better account for the impact they have on individuals' day-to-day -day lives, and to help those individuals who have been adversely affected by um, policy externalities seek remedy and compensation. So hopefully this is the most you'll hear from me throughout the day. I'll step aside, Julia. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Riggleman and Mr. Bowling for being a part of this as well. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so here to introduce the panel, we'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, it's no secret that over the last decade, the Republican Party has been pulled in multiple directions from both a policy standpoint and a constituency standpoint. From the waxing and waning of the Tea Party movement to the growing factions of populism, the party has struggled to harmonize these cliques competing interests with the interests of more traditional Republicans. Perhaps as evidence of this, the party was unable to articulate a policy platform in 2020. Now, the, the Republican Party is faced with two weighty questions. Where do we go from here? And can the experience navigating the past decade offer any guidance? Here to discuss the possible future of the GOP is Repres Representative Riggleman and Lieutenant Governor Bowling. 
Inver Riggleman is the former U.S. Congressman of Virginia's 5th District. Prior to joining Congress, Mr. Riggleman served in the United States Air Force as an intelligence officer supporting the war on terror in multiple capacities and is a distinguished graduate in foreign affairs from the University of Virginia. He's founded and served as CEO of successful contracting companies, including his current role as CEO of Riggleman Information and Intelligence Group. Mr. Riggleman also serves as chief strategist for the Network Contagion Research Institute and is author of Bigfoot, It's Complicated. Bill Bowling has a distinguished career in public service in Virginia. He served as a member and chairman of the Board of Supervisors in Hanover County and then spent 10 years in the Virginia State Senate. In 2005, Mr. Bowling was elected to serve as the 39th Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. He was re-elected to that office in 2009. Mr. Bowling has the distinction of serving as Lieutenant Governor with a Democratic Governor, Tim Kaine, and a Republican Governor, Bob McDonald. In 2018, Mr. Bowling left his career in the insurance business to pursue teaching. He currently has faculty appointments at George Mason University, Virginia Commonwealth University, and the University of Richmond, where he has taught courses in state and local government and politics, Virginia government and politics, and political parties and elections. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Bowling and be back about 1.35. Well, thank, thank you, Julia, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I want to thank you all first of all, for, for joining us for this conversation today, but also uh, especially to our friends at uh, UVA for, uh, for inviting me, and I know Denver feels the same way, inviting us uh, to participate in this, in this discussion uh, today. Uh, I'm gonna try to, to, to just kind of set the, 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 the playing field of, of where I think the Republican Party uh, in Virginia in particular stands uh, right now to say that the past decade has been a challenging decade uh, for the Republican Party would probably be an understatement. Uh, it has been a very uh, challenging uh, decade uh, indeed. Um, in fact, I was looking at some uh, statistics uh, today, and, and you may find these statistics interesting, that since 2009, when Republicans last won a statewide political campaign in Virginia, uh, Democrats have won two statewide campaigns for governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general, four campaigns for the United States Senate, uh, four presidential campaigns. Uh, Republicans have not won a single statewide political campaign in Virginia uh, in the last decade, while uh, Democrats have won the last 14 uh, statewide political campaigns. Now, those should be pretty depressing statistics for most Republicans. Uh, if you look at those statistics, uh, combined with the fact, of course, that Republicans have also lost control of Virginia's congressional delegation, which used to be eight Republicans and three Democrats. It's now seven Democrats and four Republicans. And not to mention the fact that, that Republicans have also lost control of both houses of the, of the Virginia General Assembly. You would think that uh, thinking Republicans would look at that and say, we have a problem. Uh, but there are still a lot of Republicans who are kind of in denial. Uh, honestly, of the fact that there that there is a a, a problem, uh, these these challenges that the Republican Party faces in Virginia, I think, have probably come about uh, from uh, uh, three different causes. One is the type of candidates uh, that the party has tended to nominate. Uh, two is the simple fact that Virginia has changed uh, over the course of the past uh, decade dramatically, and as Virginia has moved more to the to the center. And maybe even the center left in many parts of the of the state, the Republican Party has continued to move farther and farther to the right. And then uh, the, the final factor is just the external uh, political environment that uh, is created more at a, at a national level. All of these three things together uh, have created a significant challenge that Virginia Republicans are really uh, struggling uh, with today. Now, it's hard for Virginia Republicans to control the national external uh, political environment, but it is should not be hard uh, for Republicans to control the type of candidates that they nominate uh, and the type of campaigns uh, that those uh, candidates uh, run. And the truth is that in order for Republicans to win statewide political campaigns in Virginia, uh, they, they really have to do what Bob McDonnell and I succeeded in doing in 2009 uh, we were the last Republican candidates for governor and lieutenant governor to win statewide uh, in Virginia. Um, you have to nominate candidates that can appeal to a broad cross-section of Virginia, not just 
the most conservative wing of the Republican Party, but to a much broader cross section of Virginia. And then you have to nominate candidates that run campaigns that talk not just about the issues that energize and mobilize the base of the Republican Party, but that uh, run campaigns that can reach out to that broader uh, cross section of, of Virginia. And uh, that's, uh, you know, as you look back, that's what Bob McDonald and I did uh, in 2009. Uh, we ran a campaign that talked about building a better Virginia. It was a campaign that focused on what we called kitchen table uh, issues in Virginia. How do we get the economy moving again? How do we create jobs for Virginians? And then how do we invest in programs that make the quality of life better uh, for, uh, for Virginians, improving educational opportunities, improving our transportation system, making health care more available and more affordable. Now, we, 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 we were two conservative guys, and we took our conservative principles and values with us, but we related them to these issues that Virginians really passionately, uh, uh, passionately care about. But, and it worked. Uh, you know, we won that race by 16, 17 points. Uh, we carried places like Fairfax, Loudoun, Prince William, Henrico, Chesterfield, Virginia Beach, and Chesapeake, all of which uh, Republicans proceeded to lose uh, in the last uh, gubernatorial campaign in, in 2017. So the, the Republican message can still resonate in Virginia. Uh, I think a center-right conservative message can still resonate uh, in Virginia. Uh, but the party has to nominate candidates who can connect with this broader cross-section of Virginia voters, and those candidates have to run campaigns that can connect uh, with a broader cross-section of Virginia voters. Um, now, that may sound simple. I'll just close by sharing a few more thoughts on what makes it more difficult. Um, you know, when I teach courses uh, on uh, political parties at George Mason or at VCU or the University of Richmond, one of the things I try to get people to understand is that political parties are not monolithic organizations. And we sometimes think they are. We think all Republicans are the same and all Democrats are the same, but they're not. Uh, there are within every political party, uh, these extended party networks. Parties are made up of lots of different wings and lots of different uh, factions. And uh, unfortunately right now in the Republican party, the factions that seem to be in control of the party are not factions that tend to want to nominate the kind of candidates that can win statewide campaigns, nor are they motivated by the message that those candidates need to create in order to appeal to a broader cross-section of Virginia voters. So we end up turning aside uh, candidates who actually have the ability to win and run campaigns that can connect with a broader cross-section of voters and instead nominate candidates that really appeal only to the farthest right wing of the Republican Party and don't have the ability to then connect with that broader cross-section of voters. So I've kind of, uh, you know, I, I think we see this, by the way, playing out again uh, in the Republican nominating process that's going on right now uh, in Virginia leading up to the 2021 race for for governor. So I, I sometimes put it this simply to my fellow Republicans. The, the biggest decision I think that the Republican Party has to make as we talk about building platforms that win future elections uh, is what the party wants to be. Uh, does the party want to be a club for people who merely want to engage in the great right wing ideological debates of the day? Or does the party want to be an organization that has the ability to elect candidates to public office, earn the right to lead, and then hopefully lead effectively? Those, I think, are the challenges facing the Republican Party uh, in Virginia today. And I think those are, as simplistically as I might make it sound, the solutions uh, to those challenges. But getting 50.1% of Republicans uh, to see it that way is a much more difficult and, and challenging thing. And uh, one has to really look, I think, uh, no longer, uh, no farther back than, than 2018 uh, to really, in 2020, to see the challenges that, uh, that, our, that our party uh, faces. Um, in, in, if you go back even farther than that to 2014, when the party turned away uh, a person who was on the verge of becoming Speaker of the House of Representatives in, in Eric uh, Cantor. Uh, we saw these same debates in the uh, uh, 2020 
uh, cycle uh, for um, the Virginia General Assembly, 2019 cycle for the Virginia General Assembly when the party turned away um, reasonable conservatives like uh, Delegate Chris Peace in the 97th district. And of course we saw it, um, uh, uh, frankly, in the most recent uh, congressional uh, processes uh, when uh, one of, I think, a, a very effective Virginia political leader who had uh, was doing a great job in Congress and had incredible potential for the future in the fifth district uh, was also turned aside uh, by members of his own party. And of course, that's my, my friend and fellow panelist here today, uh, Denver uh, Riggleman. So uh, while I certainly have my own experiences in the challenges facing the party going back to 2012 and 2013, uh, Denver, you, you have experienced them uh, more recently uh, than, than have I. Um, so uh, I've kind of given a, a broad brush of what I think some of the challenges are, but you have a very timely and unique perspective on what they are as well. And so I'm going to stop there and turn it over to you and, and let you share some of your general thoughts uh, on the same subject to, uh, to keep the, uh, lay the lay the groundwork for our coming discussion. Thank you so much, and Bill. It's an honor to be here with you, by, by the way, buddy. Let me tell you, I, I was looking forward to having this conference with you, and uh, it's so funny you're talking about appealing to a broad cross-section of voters. I thought I sort of had that nailed until that convention in 2020, right, Bill, and, and how that went down. And I think part of what Bill was referring to, and, and again, I, I, you know, I have this recency. Uh, obviously, I don't have the encyclopedic knowledge of Virginia politics that Bill has, uh, everybody out there, but as far as what's happened in the last three years or so, I've been able to see it sort of on the front lines and what happens uh, when a party really is more worried about, and Bill mentioned a lot of this, which was fantastic to hear, more worried about engaging in sort of a right wing ideological effort rather than reaching out to a broad cross section of voters for the Republican party to win something. A lot of people know my background was intelligence, it was data, uh, it was being a CEO, it was being in counterterrorism, but it was creating companies too. And I think going from military intelligence all the way to building companies always had this sort of, uh, and by the way, I wasn't in politics. I don't know if anybody has seen my bio. There wasn't a whole lot of politics there, but I always thought that working you know, with people was the best way to get things done. It was outcome-based, not ideologically based. And I took that when I sort of accidentally won uh, in 2018 for Congress, uh, when my predecessor resigned suddenly uh, after the nomination process, and when I won pretty handily in the general, uh, I remember, I believe, and, and, and Bill, I think you'll find this interesting, I think I had the most votes, cross votes, in all the districts. Uh, Tim Kane and I shared about 10,000 votes, and uh, I was one of the only uh, person in the country to win an open seat during a blue wave, and won by about seven points, which was above the PBI of the district, and it would immediately, as soon as I went up on the hill, like Denver, you're, you're probably the future of the party. You're independent minded, you're a little bit more social libertarian. This is what we think, you know, where we need to go. It immediately was uh, put into, you know, the whip team. They said, Denver, you need to be on the financial services committee, which was an A committee. But what I found out really quickly and what Bill alluded to was that I was fighting a multi-flank war. It wasn't just the war up on the hill, right? Being in the minority in Congress and the Republican conference and what they want you to do. It was a fight against the Republican committees of the fifth district and the fact that I was getting in the way of their ability uh, to dictate what they wanted to dictate for a number of reasons. I think one of the reasons the Republican party is struggling so much is that there really isn't a policy platform that we can sort of hold on to right now. I thought that we would be the party of policy and ideas. As many of you know, um, I would say that, um, and I would try to put this delicately, I would say that it was around uh, summer of 2019 when I knew I was in big trouble. And that was after I officiated the same sex wedding. I knew there would be some blowback. What I didn't realize is that the first time that I heard um, about the conspiracy theory surrounding me because of that same sex wedding. And when you talk about this right wing ideological sort of push or this populist push or this almost quasi authoritarian push in the Republican party right now, what I found out is that I don't know if anybody, I hope you guys aren't shocked by this, but you do know I was funded by George Soros to change the sexual orientation of children, right? And um, I was also told that I was part of the deep state cabal uh, that was here to, to change the country. I was a globalist. All this just came from that wedding. And so at that point, instead of me pandering or instead of me saying, hey, I'm not that, 
what I did was I doubled down to say that I believe that the Republican Party stood for a government that stayed out of our pocketbooks and business, but also stayed out of our bedroom. And I would told people, I don't believe that the Republican Party should just be small enough to fit in the bedroom. I honestly thought if I had this outcome-based or solution-based idea to doing things, the legislation I was putting forward, the $60 million we got for rural broadband, getting Danville uh, on the NDAA lines, which is the National Defense Authorization Act, getting them as the critical ship building skills center of excellence here in Virginia. So now I had the Department of Defense funding at NDAA. We had, we had, we, we had gotten the state onto the hemp um, crop insurance program. I was looking at hemp opportunity zones. You know, I, I co-sponsored about 350 bills and was primary on about 15 to 16 bills. I was one of the only Republican freshmen to get multiple bills and red lines passed through Congress. I thought that solution-based, outcome-based, performance-based type of activity would see me through. And what I didn't realize, to everybody out there, what I didn't realize is that the emotion of this was something I couldn't overcome. Even being an intelligence officer, even thinking that I can, you know, see something in analysis, I underestimated the vitriol that came at me um, right after the wedding, uh, but also when I voted to streamline immigration uh, in HR 1044. And so those are some of the things that happened is that once, you know, I said, listen, the Republican Party should be a party that's inclusive and should be a big tent. Um, I think that's what Bill was referring to when he's talking about the history with him and what him and the governor could do back in what 2009 was pretty amazing, right? To win by that margin, uh, to be able to sort of cross paths, right? Cross pollinate with Democrats to say, yeah, we're center right, but we also realize that there's a solution that we need, the Virginia way that we need to follow to make sure everything happened in a way that made sense. That is gone. And I think what you have when you have this nativism, right? Or this extreme sort of tribalism and you're not dealing in facts and policy, when you're, build, when you're dealing in conspiracy theories or disinformation, all of a sudden the fight is this, and this was the fight for me. Do I pander? Do I go over and say, listen, do I apologize for the things that I know I, I, I did that were correct? Do I wink and nod? Do I dog whistle at some of these ridiculous things that are happening based on, for instance, election integrity being a cover term for Stop the Steal right now? What do I do? I decided to double down with facts, and what happened was it didn't work out very well because Knowing that I would win a primary, they chose a convention. So here's the other thing that we have. We have an election every year in Virginia. And what I found is you have these convention fixers or these specific type of individuals that wade in these swamps and these, in these fields, and they make money by sort of controlling or uh, consolidating their power in these small pockets around the Commonwealth. I think that is what's destroying the Republican Party. I think we have a dearth of ideas I think when you have somebody like Bill, when you, when you see what the pattern was, how we could win with the type of people we needed to win statewide, we went away from that as quickly as possible. And now you're looking at what a dozen years where Virginia uh, has not really been able to push the Republican ball down the field with policy and ideas where it is becoming nativist or some people are doing things and saying things that make no sense to a normal operating population. Um, I'm gonna try to continue to stay involved uh, it's very difficult for me not having the political lineage uh, to want to continue to beat my head against a wall, right? To, to bloody my nose, right? Every day that, that I try to change things. But I do believe that people that don't like politics like myself and sometimes despise it, I think those are the people that need to be involved. And it's exhausting, right? If, if it's not something you're used to when it comes to the political grind and the constant attacks, even with me, you know, you still have to grow a thick skin after a few years. And I think Bill probably has the thickest skin, you know, of most Republican politicians in Virginia. But when you see the people that are staying involved, those are the people who have no other appreciable skills, uh, where politics is all they want to do. And if the Republican Party is going to come back into vogue when it comes to a, a party of ideas, when it comes to a party of policy, when it comes to a party of hope, I think we do have to have more pragmatic candidates and candidates that look at facts-based uh, solutions and analysis rather than looking at things like Stop the Steal or QAnon or, or, or Mike Flynn or Sidney Powell or the Kraken or any of that nonsense that we see out now with the Republican Party. So I know that it's about 124. I know there's probably going to be questions and, and things like that. So I do appreciate everybody having me. And Bill, again, what an honor to be here with you. And, and I hope that was a good start to, to what I see and what happened to me, you know, when I was uh, serving in Congress. Denver, uh, you have a unique uh, 
perspective from the experiences that you had in 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 your last uh, race and and comparable to the experiences that I had back in 2012 and, and 2013. Um, you know, it, you would think sometimes it's easy for a political party to say, okay, we were doing this and we were winning. And since then we've been doing that and we're losing. Let's go back and do this again. But there, there just seem to be a lot of people right now in positions of influence in the party who want to keep doing the thing that, that has cost us majorities as opposed to doing things that helped us gain uh, majorities. And that's the challenge I, I think that the Republican Party faces. There's a, there's a political science, uh, science theory that we talk sometimes academically about, and, and that is within political parties, it's pragmatists versus purists. And right now in the Republican Party, it certainly seems as though the ideological purists are driving kind of that discussion that pulls the party farther and farther to the right as opposed to pragmatists who understand that the ultimate job of a party is to elect its candidates uh, to public office so they can lead and, and hopefully uh, lead effectively. And uh, the best way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do something here that I'm not terribly good at doing. I'm gonna try to share a screen and pop, uh, uh, pop just a, a slide up that I think may, may make this point. And um, I, can you all see that screen? If you can, shake your heads. Is anything coming up? Got it. Okay. Got it. okay. Let me get in here and make sure I'm sharing the one that I that I want to uh, want to share the page that I want to share. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to it, but uh, let me give it a shot here. Um, it's a map of. Um, hopefully, are you seeing a map of Virginia that looks a little orange and a little green? I see them all, buddy. Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, if you look at that map of Virginia on your screen, uh, one of the things that, that it illustrates uh, pretty clearly is the changing demographics that have taken place in our state uh, over the course of time, where um, the vast, uh, an increasingly vast percentage of our population is living uh, in very urban and suburban areas uh, across Virginia. And it is in these areas that the Republican Party uh, has uh, really had a, a terrible time uh, in the recent past when it comes to, to winning. If you look at that slide that hopefully is on the screen uh, now, it, it shows uh, the percentage of the vote that Bob McDonald and I got in key geographical areas, urban and suburban areas of Virginia in 2009 uh, versus the vote that Republicans got in those same areas in 2017. I think those numbers pretty strikingly show um, how much of the vote Republicans have lost in these parts of the state that are growing and growing the most rapidly. It is these urban and suburban centers. It's Northern Virginia, it's the suburbs in and around Richmond and Hampton Roads. And Republicans can continue to get 65% of the vote in rural parts of the state uh, and lose statewide elections because of the vast population concentrations in these other parts of the state. And to appeal to voters in these other parts of the state, clearly we have to get back to a more effective platform uh, that appeals to these voters who are living in places like Northern Virginia uh, and the suburbs around Richmond and Hampton Roads. And it, it, it kind of is that simple analogy of someone once asked John Dillinger why he robbed banks. And his answer was, that's where the money is. And in politics, if you don't have a message that connects with voters in those parts of the state where the vast majority of the populace lives, you're gonna have a hard time winning these top of the ticket statewide political campaigns. So the, my point is the demographics show Virginia Republicans what we need to do to win. And the question is whether or not the leadership and then the grassroots of the party is willing to accept that message, to embrace that message and to, to build on that message uh, in the in the future. So again, just a couple of uh, slides there that I, that I hope showed up okay uh, to give you a feel for what I think are some of the demographic changes taking place in Virginia and some of the challenges that pragmatists within the Republican Party really have to figure out uh, how to come to grips with. And you know, Bill, I don't think that I would pass any ideological uh, purity test right now in the Republican Party just based, again, what I was telling about on my past of, you know, just getting things done. The reason I think I was center right, and, and I'm still right, is because I am more fiscally conservative. I'm, I'm not a big fan of government regulations, right, Bill? I, I think there is, you know, some place uh, for government. I think there's an efficient form of government, but not no government. 
And I remember I had individuals say, listen, Denver, you know, I can't believe that you're out there, you know, trying to get the government to fund certain things. And I said, what, like rural broadband, you know, and so, or, or like, uh, you know, for instance, you know, when you're looking at farming subsidies, right? And Bill, I know, you know, all these arguments that, that I would go down looking at, uh, you know, tobacco farmers here in the fifth district, and they would say, Denver, it's not fair. You know, these are Republicans. Like, why didn't we get those subsidies, right? That other, you know, farming individuals aren't, why, why aren't we on the list? This is ridiculous. And so you have individuals who say they want limited government, but still really rely on the government in rural areas or in Republican areas when it comes to health care also. Um, and for instance, you know, uh, when you're looking at um, you're looking at Obamacare, pre-existing conditions, all those things, I don't think people realize that in Virginia, seven of the 17 federally funded community health centers are in the fifth district of Virginia, mine, right? A district bigger than New Jersey, Bill. And those individuals, if we would have taken away pre-existing conditions or funding for those public uh, health centers, it would have just collapsed the health system in the rural part of Virginia in Southside. And I tried to explain it just like that. And I would try to say, hey, this is, this is the issues we have. There's real issues. If you look at Fauquier County with 2.4% unemployment, this was before COVID, and you look at Brunswick County with 4.8% unemployment and maybe 20% underemployment, there's a real disparity here that we have to have real solutions to try to fix these things. I remember I was at a committee meeting and we had an individual um, really uh, uh, sort of bear into me the fact that I was uh, on a, and I know this is gonna surprise people in this forum, but I was on a uh, amendment with Abigail Spanberger uh, from Virginia 7 with a $55 million addition for rural broadband. This was the first bill I voted on, by the way, to open the government, which is what a way to start. Um, and uh, I voted yes on that bill. And a lot of people sort of lost their minds that there wasn't enough funding for the wall or, you know, this was ridiculous. How could we do this? And then what they didn't know, what I tried to explain to people is that pragmatically with world broadband funding, but also with other funding that benefited the fifth with the farmers that we have there, um, this was a huge way to reopen the government. And I remember 400 correction officers also writing to me saying that they couldn't feed their families. There is a pragmatism that we have to practice. There is an ideological bent to the reason that say Bill and I are Republicans, but it is right. There are, uh, there are multiple factions in the Republican party. And right now, if you have 70% of the Republican party saying they believe the election was stolen, right? That is a big issue for the Republican party. Or they think that there's a deep state cabal Trump coming to get them. There's not. What we have to do is we have to have a big tent party I would humbly submit though, we don't want a carnival tent. Uh, and that's the issue that we have is that we want this inclusive party, but are we going to reach out to individuals that could be damaging for the long-term health of the United States? And Bill, you know, you, your talk about, and I wanted to say this about, you know, this, this ideological um, sort of rift uh, between those who are idealists or ideologues and those who are pragmatists and the pragmatists want the party to succeed. I think there's another thing there too that, that you probably were leaning towards is that, isn't this supposed to be about service? And I would, I would hope the decisions I make are more for the 750,000 people in the fifth district or, you know, Bill, when you made a decision, it was for the millions of people in the state, right? As Lieutenant governor um, and the governor, that is what's amazing. And I wanna go back to this. Is there a Bill Bowling type of person left that could be a Lieutenant Governor with a Democratic Governor? Um, I would hope that there's more Bill Bowlings going forward statewide uh, than there are Corey Stewart's because that would be destructive to the Republican Party for whatever foreseeable future we have. And I believe that I'm more in the mold of an independent Republican or independent conservative who thinks that we do have to have pragmatism and we have to be more socially libertarian we have to realize that the Republican Party is the party of freedom. It is the party of immigrants. It is the party of being able to select what you want to do in life, regardless of your, your religious persuasion, sexual persuasion, you know, color, race, creed, ethnicity. It's about this, this, this amazing way of gathering everybody together for freedom. And Bill, I hope that that's where we go. And, uh, and that's why I think we have a real good chance here um, of doing things if, if we can have people who are willing to state facts, regardless of winning or losing. Agreed. Yeah, I fully, I fully agree. And, uh, you know, I'll just, Julie, maybe add one other thought and then open it up, you know, turn it over to you to open up for some questions. But, you know, I think Denver, Denver hit the button uh, when he, you know, conservative Republican ideas properly applied still appeal. 
uh, to, uh, I think, people in America, and I think they appeal to, to people in Virginia. But, um, but those same uh, principles improperly applied uh, aren't going to appeal to anybody except the farthest right wing of the Republican Party. And that is not a coalition sufficient enough uh, to win elections. And, and as Denver said, if you can't win elections, you can't lead. And if you can't lead, um, then what's the purpose of this process that we're involved in? Because ultimately, it should be about public service, and it should be about making Virginia a better place or, or making an America a better place consistent with those shared values that, 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 that we hold. So, Julia, hopefully that gives us a foundation to, 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 to talk a little bit more about. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a couple of questions in the chat. I'm kind of going to combine a few of them because they're all hinting at the same thing. They're talking about moderates in the Republican Party and about how the Trump conservatives and the, they seem to be the louder voices in the GOP right now that have pushed out a lot of moderates. So the questions are all kind of running through how can we keep the moderates in the party one and then convince them to vote in primaries two and is there a way that they can kind of regain the republican party or are they just kind of stuck being on the sideline here or feeling a little bit politically homeless yeah um well i'll share a couple thoughts on that and then i'm sure denver denver will do the same i think there's still a lot of center-right republicans out out there um uh, you know, people that are more in the mold of maybe traditional Reagan type uh, Republicans that can talk about conservative values, relate them to the issues that people care about, and do so in a, in a way that lifts people up as a, and, and brings people in, as opposed to, to maybe driving people away. Um, you know, to be successful, politics has to be about addition and multiplication. It can't be about subtraction and division. And that, I think, is what true kind of uh, Reagan Republicans are are all about, and and that's that's the way I always tried to embrace uh, policy. Um, interestingly, when I ran in 2005 for lieutenant governor and in 2009 for lieutenant governor, the rub against me from most of my opponents was that I was too conservative. Um, I was the far right wing <laughs> of, the, of the Republican Party. And today, of course, I'm a squishy moderate rhino wimp. I mean, you know, it's just, a, it's a, you know, I'm no different, but the definitions of what it takes to be a, quote, conservative Republican have so changed that a lot of that, uh, of us folks who are really kind of center right and Reagan mold um, now are viewed as being these squishy moderate rhino wimps. Well, there are a lot of us out there. I accept that label. If somebody wants to call me a rhino, that's fine. Uh, you know, with, with, with me. Um, I know who I am and I know what I believe in. And I know there are a lot of other Republicans that still believe in offering that kind of optimistic, hopeful, futuristic message about how conservative values lift people up. And uh, per perhaps we, th th those voices are being drowned out a little bit right now uh, in the Republican Party, but they can reassert themselves. And I think there's still an effort to reassert themselves. And then the, the, the last uh, thought I'll share before giving Denver a chance to do the same, is that the Republican Party is not alone in facing these challenges. Um, you know, the Democratic Party faces its own share uh, of extended party networks, its own share of different factions and, and, and wings. And, uh, you know, I was intrigued just last week to see where Democratic Socialists had seized control of the state party apparatus in Nevada. And as a result of that, a lot of the more traditional Democrats in Nevada had resigned their position. So I think both parties uh, face this challenge. Democrats, I think, have done a better job managing it, frankly, than Republicans have done managing it. Uh, but this drift of the Republican Party, uh, I think we see the same drift, maybe the opposite direction uh, in the Democratic Party. It's up to more reasoned voices in both parties, I think, to regain control of that process within their party, and then hopefully apply those same uh, broader principles to government as a whole. And, you know, uh, I think um, I would say this, I never thought that I would be sort of a facts based pariah, right, or a radical in the Republican Party, because I always go back to data and facts when talking about any number of issues. And, you know, Bill, you know, being called a rhino, you know, I've, uh, I think I've been called about every name possible uh, from the left and the right, which is really exciting, by the way, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Um, if I put them all on a wall, I think I could actually paint walls with the number of names that I've been called. Um, but I think you're right about this drift. I don't think crazy is party specific. 
Um, we might have people saying the Republican Party is having a hold my beer moment right now. But um, when you talk about Nevada, when I just saw that down there with the Democratic Socialists taking over the party, there's absolute panic, right, from the Democratic Party about what's happening there. It was it was really interesting to read about that. The the panic that how how could we have gotten here, right? Why are we here when we're starting to why why are we why are we pulling uh, you know failure from the jaws of success, right? We're not quite certain what's going on here. You're seeing that in the Republican Party, I think, over and over and over again. And what is a moderate anyway? What what it, what is that in the Republican Party now? What 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 defines a Republican? So say me, I I'm cool with marriage equality. Does that make me a squish, or does that make me a liberty loving conservative? What does that make me? Right. Um, if you look at liberal classic values, it would make me a Republican. Um, you know, and that, that's that's the thing that we have here is that labels that are applied to individuals from others. Those labels are usually applied by people who have some type of um, they got skin in the game to make sure that they push people like Bill and myself down or other people that are trying to do something for the Republican Party because it takes away the narrative that they want to push, but also might take away from the money. Um, you know, we have to be honest, the Republican and Democratic parties are also businesses. Um, so when it comes to uh, somebody who they might define as a moderate or somebody who's a rhino, and by the way, rhinos are pretty tough, right, when you look at the animal kingdom. Um, I think when they when they say things like that, it's up to us to push back and say, listen, here are the facts of the matter. Uh, and this is what we can do. And I don't want people to be too pessimistic. I lost in a church parking lot with twenty five hundred people in a district of seven hundred fifty thousand. The reason that they pushed a convention, these very people that Bill were alluding to, uh, is because they knew they could not beat me in a primary. So there is that hope. There's that optimism that somebody like me, right, somebody who doesn't have the political pedigree but has the business and intelligence background, right, to do some pretty crazy things and great things for the Commonwealth, that we can win. And so I'm not as – I'm pessimistic about what I'm seeing with committees around the country and the Stop the Steal nonsense and, 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 and President Trump still uh, really playing an outsized role uh, from what he actually did for the country. Um, but I do believe – uh, at some point, either the Republican Party is going to completely self-destruct um, or we're going to see this sort of burgeoning movement of a, of a more practical way of looking at things and conservative ideas that we can execute uh, that help individuals. Because when you talk to people, there's not a lot of people who think the Democratic Party, you know, is, is moderating at this point. Uh, so now you have the fringes dictating policy and conversation. We have to bring that back to the middle because I still think and I hope I'm right. Um, I still hope 60 to 70 percent of the American public aren't nuts. And uh, if they're not nuts, I think we got a chance. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's really interesting that you both picked up on how neither party is really appealing to moderates right now, because that's another question that we have. Um, do you see the creation of a more moderate third party as a solution to increasing polarization on both sides? Um, is that something that would be politically feasible? Maybe we set aside the structural issues that come with the two-party system and just talk about if it'd be politically feasible to have a third party that you could pull from both more center sides of the left and right. Well, if you look at, if history is an indicator, it's it's hard, you know, to, to actually do that. 60% of the American people say they want a viable third party, uh, but of course, nowhere near 60% of the American people actually vote uh, for third party candidates or independent candidates. Uh, the, the, the two-party system, whether we like it or not, is, is very entrenched for lots of reasons uh, into the American political system. So, uh, you know, as, as nice as that may sound, the, the, the academician within me from a realistic standpoint, you know, says that that's a hard thing to, to, to really accomplish. However, the, the historian within me would note that it has happened before. You know, we have had party realignments before. In fact, in the early days of our country, we had party realignments frequently, uh, but we really haven't had a major party realignment uh, uh, in America uh, since the 1850s, the 1860s. We've had this two-party system with Republicans and Democrats. Now, realignment can occur within those political parties, and that's what I think we've seen over the course of the past 20 years. I think we've seen a realignment taking place within the Republican Party, not for the better, uh, in my judgment, but but an internal realignment. And I think we're seeing the same thing starting to take place in the Democratic Party, probably not for the not for the not for the better. Um, so, you know, my hope is that that 
responsible leaders in both parties um, will continue to resist the most extreme voices of either the left or the right, and for the good of the country, try to govern in a more centrist uh, type of a type of a way. But that's not the drift that that we kind of see out there right now, and that's what frustrates. Um, you know, many people who may consider themselves to be of a more, you know, center right or center left uh, type of a political philosophy. Um, but will that result in some sort of major party realignment, a disintegration of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? You know, over time, these parties have proven to be uh, very resilient, but to remain resilient, they have to be open to change. And I think that's the kind of change that we're talking about with, within the Republican Party. Um, but it, it is the same kind of a conversation that probably needs to be happening within the Democratic Party as well. Yeah, and listen, um, pragmatically, you talk about practically, yeah, the two-party system is pretty entrenched. And um, But I will say this, if there's anybody, I want to say this clearly, I would love to see a viable third-party movement, and I would love to be a part of it. And, you know, that's something that I've been talking to many people about across the spectrum. Um uh, yeah, to say that I haven't got a call from every major organization, Republican organization, uh, that wants to see a change in the party uh, would be wrong to say. It, it has been amazing what's happened to my phone um, just since the, the, that convention in June. But once I did the QAnon resolution and once I started to talk about why facts-based analysis and why reason and, and data is where the Republican Party should be, I've gotten a lot of people calling me like, well, Denver, obviously you're, you're the guy who should run as an independent. And, um, and I can tell you guys how difficult that is because there's one factor that the parties bring that isn't there for that third party money run and that's money. Um, there's a financial aspect to this. And, I, and what I've told people is like, you need to put your money where your mouth is because I can, I can go out there and, and blow bubbles and, and run through the streets and say, hey, look at me, I'm the third party candidate. But if you can't reach people, you're gonna have a tough time, right? Uh, you know, whether it's in print media, whether it's digital, uh, whether it's traditional media or whether it's television, um, all of that, you have got to have the ability to get your message out there. Now, if say I were to run as an independent in 21 as a governor, would I get a lot of national media and earned media? Sure, I would. But again, um, do people, the 60% that Bill talked about that want to start a third party, are they willing to put the money where their mouth is? Are they willing to pull that lever? And is there ever a time where an independent candidate can step up and say, listen, I'm not pulling votes away from the Democrats and Republicans. They're pulling votes away from me. And that's, the, I don't know how to get there. I wish I was smart enough right now to know how to get there but with all the levers that you would have to pull. But Virginia is unique. We've always sort of led the way in, in, in doing things other people don't. And I'm wondering if it is Virginia um, where we can do something like this. Now, could I pull center left and center right? I, I talked about the Denver Crats that were out there and the rig publicans, right? And all these people who call them that. And, and But here's the thing is that I've got to have the energy to do it. Like Bill would have the energy to do it if he wanted to do it again. We'd have to have the funding, but we'd also have to build an, arc, an infrastructure from scratch. And that takes an amazing amount of work, an amazing amount of energy, an amazing amount of money. And we're actually poking our fingers into the eyes of two massive billion dollar organizations in the Republican and Democratic Party. Because right now we have two organizations that are running the country. That's why I believe a third party movement is, is uh, needed, but it's hard. And, and like Bill said, you know, we can, ideologically, it sounds beautiful. How lovely is that? But practically it would take an amazing amount of effort, money, um, and it would take people who are willing to step up and, and, and go into the breach. Unless you're Jesse Ventura, it's kind of hard to pull that off. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, either of us, Denver, could compete with Jesse Ventura. No, I, I, I mean, if, if somebody who looks like that can win, though, I might have a chance <laughs> you know, down the road. All right. Well, we've got about four minutes left. So time for one more question. And this is one that I was really excited. I was going to ask you this, whether somebody submitted it or not. So I'm glad that somebody did submit it. But um, who do you think would be the best kind of non-Trump candidate for 2024? Oh, not wing, not just not not just their last name isn't Trump, but they are not Trump wing part of the Republican Party. Who's the best one in your opinion? No, oh, God. Yeah. yeah. 
Go ahead, Denver. I'll let you take that. Oh, you let me go first on this one? Oh, the best non-Trump candidate. Um, hell, you know, I do believe that if I ran for president in 24, I could get less than 1% like a lot of candidates. I want everybody to know that. Um, but, um, you know, I know there's some people that are planning. Um, and I, but gosh, I know some people that are planning that I can't talk about yet. Um that would be sort of this, you know, uh, what I'm talking about here, this non-Trump type of candidate you were talking about, right? Um, but I don't think it can be anybody who's made the trek to Mari Lago to kiss the ring. Um, if people are doing that, I, I'm not interested in you. Um, if you're that beholden to one individual uh, and you think that uh, bootlicking is your way to the, to the power, you know, to the White House, uh, you know, I'm not your person. Um, so as far as a person right now that I've seen that's sort of declared, uh, and, and Bill, I, I honestly, I would answer this. I'm not afraid to answer questions. I can't think of one name right now um, on the people that I think are going to run, whether it's Cruz or Rubio, right, or, or Holly, um, any of these individuals. I would be interested in a Kinzinger, just, but Adam, you know, would have a really tough time right now on the Republican side. But a Kinzinger type of personality, maybe, and I'm not trying to be arrogant, but a me type of personality, a Bill Bowling type of personality, something like that I'm looking for. I just haven't, I, I don't know yet who that person would be. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, Charlie, a Charlie Baker type, a Larry Hogan from Maryland, maybe. Um, but more conservative side, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. But those are some of the names that, I, that you know, I could throw out there. Well, I was hoping Denver would go long enough that I wouldn't have to weigh in on that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I guess uh, I, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a shot at it. I, I guess my answer to that question would be no one that we see on the horizon right now. Um, and I, I do think that ultimately the, 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 the challenge as, as to who becomes that next leader in the Republican Party post-Trump, whether that's in 2024 or 2028, you know, time will tell. But I suspect it's someone that we're not really talking about right now. Um, it, it's someone that emerges maybe from the congressional level, uh, maybe from uh, maybe from a governor's office someplace around the country. But my hunch is it's a it's a new face. It's 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 someone that that that's not a part of that current discussion. And I just don't know who that might be of the uh, of the folks who are a part of the current discussion. There are. Uh, there are people who would probably be uh, Trump too, uh, for better or worse, depending on how you see that and the approach they take to national politics. Uh, and then there would probably be people that you might look at and say, well, that would be a refreshing change, but they don't have the ability within the party to realistically be able to, to obtain a, a nomination. Some of those, for example, that Denver just talked about. So, you know, my guess is whenever post-Trump is, and that's something Republicans are going to have to figure out, is this post-Trump? Is post-Trump post-2024? I don't know yet, but uh, my hunch is whoever is post-Trump may end up being someone that we're not right now even thinking about, uh, we're not right now even talking about. Yeah, absolutely. That definitely makes sense. Well, I want to thank both of you very much for contributing your time and insight. This has been a truly fascinating and very, very intellectually stimulating conversation just to think through what has happened and what still might be to come. So thank you very much for your time. And I am going to toss it back over to Jeff and we will take a short break before the next panel. Thank you guys. Thank you guys thank you. for having us. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye guys.